Hey, yo, what's up, fam? Episode two of Scorch the Fears podcast. We're here with Eric, Eric Pinelas. Is that how you say your last name? Pinuelas. Pinuelas. With an that N-Y. is with an N-Y? Yeah. Is it actually with an N-Y? Yeah. I never knew that. Pinuelas. That's hilarious. I never knew that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's sick. Cool. Um, what type of name is that? Are um, you Latino? Yeah. I'm half Mexican, half American. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's solid. Oh, yeah. All right, dude. I'm going to Steve train this a little bit. So how do you how do you get started in real estate? Um, so, I mean, I got started when I was like in third grade. I really loved building Legos mm-hmm. and I love building things. And so um, I decided a good thing to do would be go in engineering and in, in civil engineering. You build things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I went ahead and applied myself there. I was good at math, all these stuff. And, um, you know, after college, I, within college, I I discovered my entrepreneurial, um, you know, this just drive, you Mm -hmm. know, to build something. And, um, so I got into construction management after I got out of college and I built hospitals, multifamily things Mm -hmm. and, you know, I learned how to design stuff as a civil engineer. I learned how to build things as a construction manager. Right. I was responsible for like a hundred million dollars worth of construction Damn. delivery in the cool. Bay Area. Um, nice. So that was like a really excellent uh, transition into the real world mm-hmm. from college, where I was given an incredible amount of responsibility. Because, you know, you would imagine Jonah, if you gave me. Thirty million dollars, or a hundred million dollars, <laughs> you would hold me accountable to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, there I 100%. was after college, being held accountable for like millions and millions of dollars worth of construction delivery. Mm-hmm. Um, that was an incredibly eye-opening experience because mm-hmm. I've uh, always been very privileged growing up. Right. Um, and so being out there, boots on the ground, hard hat uh, in the field holding the construction drawings and, um, you know, all these things were, you know, experiences that were directing me toward real estate. Right. And while at, while in that construction environment, you know, it just wasn't resonating. It wasn't good. It didn't feel like a long-term fit. It was Mm -hmm. more of like a short-term thing. And so, uh, what I decided to do was, uh, join up with some mentorship programs and learn how to invest in real estate on my own and become a developer. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how we're here. Answer. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how we're here. And then it's funny because the story that because how you end up joining Astro Astro Flipping. If anybody doesn't know, I feel like most of you do. If for anybody who is watching, that um, Astro Flipping is Jamil Damji's show. It's all about the strategy of micro flipping and wholesaling. I, the funny how we met is I reached out to Eric. Were you still in construction? Do you At remember? that time? <clears throat> no. Yeah. You I, weren't in construction. Yeah. You were, you, you were thinking about wholesaling, right? Exactly. I, I exited the construction environment and made the decision, the leap of faith to just make it work with, right. with my own business and got something under contract and was marketing it. Right. So the first time, the first time I ever met Eric guys, literally I was doing the outreach method that Jamil teaches that Astro flipping teaches. Um, that was like our, for that's our mentor. One of uh, like our mentor in Astro flipping is what you do is you reach out to other wholesalers in order to get deals. And that's how I actually met Eric was I sent him a Facebook message being like, do you have any deals? And then we, I forgot I exactly. Did you? Time. Yeah, it was something in Berkeley okay. that I had under contract. Okay. And you had contacted me to buy it. Right. Yeah. Cause I was, cause yeah, I was, I was curious about it for sure. And he positioned himself to me <laughs> as a buyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he, then he flipped. Yeah. And then the strategy, guys, usually is basically start by saying that, you know, you're, you're interested in buying. And the reason why you say that a lot of times is because wholesalers, a lot of times don't understand the concept of a disposition wholesaler. I have been building my buyers list 
rapidly, probably around then I had 300 or 400, which is more than a lot of wholesalers always. But people don't really understand your value unless you position yourself as a buyer. But what you do after that is you don't you don't lie. What you do is you say basically something on the lines of, okay, so yeah, this one, I don't think it works for me, but I might have a buyer for this. Do you care if I market this? And then they give you what's called a non-exclusive option, which is basically an option more or less gives you the option to assign it, which basically gives you what's called equitable interest, which is what you need to legally wholesale a contract. So it's super important if you're doing as a disposition to have some sort of equitable interest. Usually the acquisition has a purchase contract and you need an option to show that you have equitable interest as well. So you have something to market unless you're an agent. So a little legal tip. That's the difference between a bird dog right. and a disposition wholesaler. Or a daisy chainer or whatever or you've heard of, chainer. whatever you heard of before. The equitable interest. Yeah, because it's also a thing with like permission. You want to you want to get permission from the person to market it. You want them to know you're marketing it. You want to be sure and completely understand what price they're going to get, the terms of your guys' uh, JV agreement. So it's really smart to do that a lot of times. And I... I think it's ama- it's it's an amazing strategy for sure. I definitely didn't dispo that one, but I mean, we met. How did you? So how did you hear? Because I don't think I did. I did I tell you about Astro after? Or did you find it on your own? Yeah, yeah. We ended up because I, I don't really remember. Just kind of chit chat and told me about this mentor Jamil, mm-hmm. and um, I was looking for some structure. I was right. looking for some structure. I was in a, a prior uh, program called fortune builders right and, um, they're pretty big in the bay area like you know, i constantly hear about them in the bay area you know Different it's one. a great community mm-hmm. it's a really stellar community of investors so mm-hmm. i learned a lot from them uh but i i felt like i knew a, a little about a lot through the right. program and the astro flipping program um really gave me that deep dive into mm-hmm. wholesaling specifically nice cool yeah and that's what i was looking for yeah 100 percent. so i mean yeah and now we're here Eric's killing it in Denver, right? What are you, you only do Denver, right? And you're only a Dispo wholesaler there? Um, I'm I wrong? not only a Dispo wholesaler there. Um, I do do some acquisitions. Okay, so I'm direct to seller. You're right. I do primarily just work Denver. Right. Colorado in general. Cool. So tell me about that market a little bit. How is Denver, Colorado? I mean, a lot of times we talk about the difference between, let's say, the Bay Area and Louisiana in terms of like a high equity, high appreciation market versus a, um, a, you know, a much more buy and hold lower price market. How I know my answer for the Bay area, but I'm curious, how do you, how do you see that as being different than any other market? Cause you tried other markets, right? It wasn't like you immediately went into Denver. You know, I can speak a little bit about, you know, Denver versus other markets. I'm not an expert in every market. So, you know, it's sort of hard for me to give that like, you know, really basically we're trying to get you to sell going to Denver versus any of my markets (laughs) so that they can JV with you. You know, there's Denver is a really amazing market for the amount of activity that's going on. Um, It doesn't have very much inventory. Okay. Low inventory. Buyers really appreciate your work. Right. Um, as a wholesaler, when you mm-hmm. bring them a deal, it really matters a lot because right. there's not a whole lot of inventory. It's a huge market. Yeah. There's a lot of volume happening. Right. There. Um, so there's space for you to exist. It's not just some little yeah. rural market. Right. Um, and the price points are high enough where yeah. you can make some solid fees. What, if you don't mind me asking, what's the biggest one you've ever made on a wholesale transaction? Um, ever? was in san francisco <laughs> that's <laughs> you guys need to come out here <laughs> you guys need to come out here if you're trying to make big old fat checks i mean like let's do it for denver and then let's hear ever <laughs> yes for denver it was twenty seven thousand dollars nice that was great it's good amazing yeah it was killer deal killer very smooth transaction love it yeah love it okay so what Cause I love asking this question in general and eventually I'm going to get to the fears guys. Cause that's what this whole podcast is about. But I'm also just like interviewing my, my friends and figuring out what, uh, what's happening or hear some stories I might've never heard of. What was the worst transaction you ever had? 
Um, oh my god! And tell that story. <laughs> wow, that was bad. <laughs> we all have them. I can tell mine afterwards. Um, so it was this property in Denver, and I got mm-hmm. it under contract um, off the MLS. I've wholesale deals off the MLS before, mm-hmm. and it was fine. Um, I had a real kind of uh, just macho realtor. Um, and mm-hmm. he was kind of younger and just was like this bulldog, you know? And right. He didn't really understand the uh, dynamic. Okay. If I'm the buyer, he works for me and I call the shots. Right. But the agent's representing you as the buyer. And this is something a lot of wholesalers don't get is that they're there to serve you. They, a lot of, a lot of agents for some reason have like in their heads exactly how it's supposed to go, but you're the one who sets the rules. You're the one who they're representing and it's an attitude you'll get with time, but really you got to understand that you're the one who lays down the law. You're the one who decides what happens in the transaction. You are the one in charge. If they say something is true, it's not true unless you say it's true. In my opinion, like it's, Cause you're the buyer and I guarantee you, you guys know more. If you're on this podcast, you know more than 95% of agents. And I'm sorry if there are any agents on here, I'm sorry about this, but this is my opinion is that investors know about the investing world. Sorry. And so what happened was, you know, I gave him multiple signals. Like it, this doesn't look like this transaction's going to work. Mm-hmm. There isn't enough uh, meat on the bone. And right. I, I had sent the best guns in Denver out there, the best investors, you know, collectively, these guys are doing thousands of acquisitions per year. They have multiple contracting teams. And if they're letting me know it's not a deal, it's not a deal. And right. So um, ultimately, you know, I take accountability for everything that happens in my business. So, you know, that this was my worst transaction is ultimately my worst failure because Mm -hmm. everything is my responsibility. That's a great attitude. Um, And so, you know, what went wrong was I didn't do a good enough job, you know, putting this realtor in their place, so to speak, as you put it just now. Um, So he understood the dynamic because things can go wrong. If, you know, that's why hierarchy exists because it's important sometimes so that things don't go wrong. And so I straight up told him in writing, we need to push the inspection period because this was on the day the inspection period ended. It ended at midnight. Okay. So you were going to extend the inspection period. Did you think there was going to be a buyer or like what happened or why did you think of extending it versus canceling it? So we had some more numbers coming back. And so it's like, you know, we have some investors that are still underwriting the deal. They walked it. They want to get us back their offers. And I don't just need more time. I need a little bit more time. It's not, it's not working. I think we're going to need a price drop. Mm -hmm. Can we please just get some more time here? uh, So I can get you, you know, my best answer. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to understand how contingencies work in your state huge is it an if you're working with realtors or a passive contingency release what is the difference between those two in california it's an active contingency release so you as the buyer will be unable to lift your inspection contingency unless you sign a document right yeah that's an active signature in colorado you don't got to sign no document (laughs) <laughs> if the deadline for the inspection period is Tuesday, the contingency is gone on right. Tuesday. Right. So basically <laughs> okay. to explain it just over again, because I want you guys to understand this, because this is really important. I'm not even sure if there are any, like, are there any others? I think California might be one of the only states where that's true too. California, this is how it works is your, your inspection period can be five days, but it doesn't matter in, unless the, unless the buyer Unless I remove my inspection contingency in writing, in writing, my inspection contingency is still valid. I can get my EMD back. What happens is, is they cure me. If the, if I'm not removing it, even when I'm supposed to, then they have to cure me and I get two more days to remove it. 
which is cool. So I love California. Mm-hmm. California is the best wholesaling state. I don't care what people say. I think it's the best wholesaling and flipping state. Not a great buy and hold, but it's great for those two. So, okay, so it's passive in Colorado. So basically, guys, he has five days, no ifs, ands, or buts. And so, the, and do you have your own EMD in? Uh, I do. Okay, so he has his own money in five thousand um, dollars. It was eight. Eight thousand dollars he could potentially lose if people start screwing around. So, sorry, keep going. And so, what happened was I told him in writing, gave him a phone call. Hey, uh, we need to push the inspection period. Uh, we need a few more days. And he sent me an amendment. This was uh, on Monday. I told him that on the amendment, it said Wednesday. And I'm like, all right, great. You know, I, I signed the amendment. The guy put Wednesday of the prior week. Oh, <laughs> that's not good. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that was like really not good. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. That's bad. <laughs> wow. So then as soon as I recognized that the same evening, uh, I was like, holy shit. You know, my <laughs> EMD just went hard. Right. Um, so you are so 8,000 at risk right now. Yeah, okay. 8,000 at risk. So I'm like, okay, you know, contractually, my EMD went hard. So let's just get this thing done. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I took that, that baby to the bitter end, you know, <laughs> on market that thing so hard and uh, got to the end, couldn't make it happen. Had oh, no. And uh, did you lose that 8,000? I, I fought for it, man. Okay. I fought really hard and I got some, I got some lawyers involved, you mm-hmm. know, because we have a, a contract. You know, if I tell him in writing to do something and he right. does something else, well, who's at fault? Right. Um, it's the agent's fault. The agent has to represent you. If they screw up, then that's a, that's huge. It's called fidelity. Right. You need to have 100% fidelity in communication. And so... Explain um, what that means. I actually don't know. Like, I know what the word means, but in terms of agent, like you, like communication, clear communication or... Um, understanding of intention. Okay. So my intention, I felt, was quite clear to him that it was not looking good. I expressed to him multiple times, you know, I wouldn't be able, most likely we're not going to be able to do this, but I'm going to keep working it as hard as I can. And, um, you know, I do need an extension to the, you know, thing. And I have it in writing. We have phone calls, you know. So that fidelity was broken right? when he did that. And, you know, I'm not going to speak to why he did it. I don't know. Um, you don't think it was a mistake? It could have been a mistake. It could have it seems been like a mistake. Why would they? Could what, have been malicious. They... I don't know. Mm, interesting. He, okay. To, to push me, he really wanted me to buy it. Interesting. He really wanted. He wanted his commission. Yeah. Right. He expressed as, as that to me. He's like, I'm trying to like buy a, an engagement ring for my girl, and like he was like he was really focused on his own and his commission. Not my, not his fiduciary responsibility. Right. He's focused about his commission. Right. And so I got some lawyers involved, you know, I was like, but the, I'm losing eight G's right now because of right. your lack of professionalism. You right. didn't do your job contractually. And um, at the end of the day, you know, I spent uh, about two G's on legal demands and going back and forth with lawyers um, he worked for a large brokerage. I'm not going to name which at, they ended up kind of stonewalling me because they have ways of just making right. these things go away. Right. Um, although I did have a pretty strong argument, I could have taken him further, but the cost benefit wasn't worth it. wasn't worth it. Um, but that was, that was a tough transaction. And I learned a lot about yeah. how to manage things. Moving forward. And you're still alive, you know, guys, I think that's what people kind of don't get. I mean, I have, I have different ones also that I can get into in a second about that. Cause I feel like a lot of people get afraid about hearing those stories. When they hear those stories, they're like, damn, I never want that to happen to me. That's going to suck. That's awful. But I guarantee you if Eric wasn't doing what he was doing, there'd be, he would, if he didn't do this, he'd be losing a lot more money by not doing this. If that makes sense, he would be making way less money than if he was wholesaling um, with like whatever else he was going to do. I guarantee you he's made back his AK tenfold. Oh, yeah. Like twentyfold. 
three hundred thousand fold. <laughs> And they didn't want to fight it, you know. I didn't want to like bring that energy. Right. It's like a lot of wasn't worth the negative energy. Um, but you know, my partner uh was like, Eric, you need to stick up for yourself, you need to fight this one out because what happened was an injustice and you need to hold them accountable. Right. You know, even though you don't want to like get lawyers involved right now, Eric, you want to just I could have put that energy toward you know, cold combat. Getting more deals. Um, so, you know, it's, you got to decide, you know, which battles to pick, whether it's worth it. I don't fight a lot of battles. I'm kind of a non anti, you know, confrontational, but huge hippie. If you haven't noticed, (laughs) (laughs) you haven't noticed guys, but you know, this was one I needed to fight. I mean, I'm happy I fought that battle, Mm -hmm. even though at the end of the day, I lost 10 G's. Um, but you learned a lot from it. You learned a lot and it was, and I mean, even though, it wasn't fun at the beginning. Probably you learned a lot. Yet I had never stuck. been through a legal like process like right. that before. At so least it was you know great now. to kind of see, you know, it starts with legal demands, then it goes to mediation, then it goes to litigation. Right. And there's a pro, you know, cost benefit at each step of the way. Cool. All right. So I want to get into the fears because this is what this podcast is about is just fears in general how uh, when you're beginning with fears, at least my vision for this podcast is helping out people who are just starting in real estate or are in real estate, but have some sort of fear that's holding them back. Cause it's my personal belief that the reason why people aren't achieving what they want to achieve is because of fear, some sort of fear. I think that applies to me. I think that applies to you. I think that applies to Pace, Jamil. I think it applies to everybody, honestly, because it, at least that's how I've seen it is usually that's what's holding somebody back. So I remember the common one, I feel like, especially when you're beginning is fear of failure, right? The fear that you're not going to, who am I to get this above the ground? Why am I worthy to have millions of dollars? Why am I worthy of, um, you know, doing these deals and being like these people that I'm seeing that are a million miles ahead of me? That was my greatest fear. And I think it held me back for a really long time. Um, so I was just going to ask you, was, like, is it, was it the same fear for you? Was it any different fears? Or Yeah, man. <clears throat> Working for, uh, you know, a W-2 corporate job, got my degree. There's a certain career track you get on and you find security in that. And right. to let go of it, to pursue an entrepreneurial endeavor, uh, invokes a lot of fear. Yeah, 100%. And, and how'd, you, how'd you deal with that? Um, Because it's always there. There's always, in my opinion, there's always some sort of feel. So how do you deal with that? um, You know, I will say, you know, you know, first and foremost, like we've had a killer year. Hell yeah! We we let's go. (laughs) Well over a hundred thousand. Hell yeah! Double that. Woo! Um, Like twenty deals. Like I'd never done a deal in Colorado before this year. I'd never been to Colorado before this year. We just closed 20 deals out there. Hell yeah. Made about $200,000. Let's go. Like, you know, it's great. Amazing. It's great, but it didn't, it didn't start there. You know, right. first it, I was in W2 and I was, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be an investor. I wanted mm-hmm. certain things for myself. And yeah, there's that fear. And so, you know, how I dealt with that fear in the moment was, uh, a large part in faith, you know, it was like faith that um, the tiger that I'm seeing uh, in in front of me isn't going to kill me. Right. You know? um, there's a lot of things like fear is is kind of a uh, deceiving uh, emotion, and you really sometimes it's really warranted. Um, but most of the time it's not. Um, and logically and rationally, you can understand that um, there's a ton of abundance, mm-hmm. an extreme amount of abundance in the universe. Hunts. And all you need to do is reach out and grab it. And what, you know, some of the principles we're talking about of wholesaling, um, some of the principles that you'll learn from coaches like, Jamil at Astro Flipping, you know, those are skills that when applied, make money, lots of money. Yeah. And 
if you're concerned that that's not going to happen, uh, you really got to check yourself. So let's get into the faith thing. Cause I honestly also think that's the answer, um, for a beginner, because in the end, you don't know if it's going to work for you. It's a hard thing to say that like, that a lot of people don't talk about is like, okay, I'm seeing all these successful people. I feel like I should be able to do it, but I don't a hundred percent know if I'll be able to do it. If I haven't gotten my first deal in the end, like logically, there are so many people doing it. I feel like I can, but also I don't actually know whether I have it in myself to do it. And I think honestly, I agree that. And I, that was a good hitting point. Cause I've thought about this before that there's some sort of faith. I think it's why there's so many religious people in real estate. I'm personally not religious, but I have, but you have to have faith in something, whether it's yourself, whether it's the universe, I'm not religious. whether it's yeah. in something, what, what, when you say faith, faith in what for you? Um, you know, faith is a very personal thing. Right. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to articulate, to really right. share, you know, where my faith comes from versus your faith and right. for that to be mutually understood by both it's parties it's it's really really hard right so you know that's uh it starts with you know as for if i could define faith you know it's like i can you know this phone's in front of me man i have faith that phone's there you right. know and like you can well you, you have can, faith that your fiance is at home yeah. or something like that and i have faith there's abundance in the universe you know i have faith that you know, these things are going to work out. Right. Um, and through lived experience, I've been able to basically have that validated for myself mm -hmm. in a one-to-one -one manner. Right. And um, I think that it's something that we all uh, develop for ourselves in a really personal way, whether it's through religion or other uh, ways, you know, like it's uh, something that you've got to have to kind of build with right. yourself and you know just like when you're learning to walk i guess you know it's yeah like how do you know you're not gonna fall yeah and, and you might fall but and, but it's you like probably a, will fall here's something i'm gonna tell all of you guys right now you are gonna fail at some point it would be physically impossible for you not to fail in your entrepreneurial journey but it's why you're gonna make so much money is because you're gonna at least for me i think eventually you got to accept that you're gonna fail and that's okay it's going to happen. There's going to be a point where you, I know at some point I'm going to lose a lot more than $10,000 because I'm trying to become a millionaire. If you're trying to become a millionaire, you're going to lose thousands of dollars. If you're trying to become a billionaire, you're going to lose millions of dollars. That's, it's going to happen. I think at least for me, that helped me with my anxiety about business also was that I was just like, okay, it's going to happen. It, I'm going to accept that it's going to happen. I'm going to move on with my life and keep doing my best and keep making mistakes. And that's just is what's going to happen. What's the book? You brought out a book. So you brought up the point of failure. Right. And um, I really want to recommend this book called Mindset. Plugging it. And this was recommended to me by Tom Bailu of Impact Theory. He made Quest Nutrition. He's a billionaire. And now he's just committed himself to teaching other entrepreneurs how to succeed. And um, I've been reading it lately, and it's all about growth mindset versus mm -hmm. fixed mindset. And, right. uh, you know, failure is a really big conversation point of the book where it talks about, you know, is it a bad thing or a good thing, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's an opportunity for growth. And if you're a growth minded person, you seek out failure. If you're a fixed minded person, you fear failure. Right. And that's a, Interesting. that's a really important like concept and, and something that needs to be kind of built within yourself over time. It's not something you're really naturally born with and society right. teaches us, you know, through education and schooling that, you know, F is a failure and you're, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's, right. it's not turned into a, a growth experience. So, you know, that 10K failure, you know, that's okay that, that I, I lost 10K, I failed, but I learned a lot. Right, exactly. 100%, I love it. Um, so what fears do you think in your business right now you're experiencing? And I'll start with mine because I think this conversation always better if you, at least I 
go first, or at least I talk about my fears because this is more campfire stuff. By the way, guys, like the you you will see it soon. I'm gonna get a logo that's just a campfire because I think that's honestly what I'm trying to do here is create a campfire. It's like where people, I think that's where ancient people and people today still talk around the campfire about fears, about what they're going through. And so that, I think that's going to be the symbol for this podcast for sure that I'm going to get on here eventually. But my fears now in terms of my business, there are a couple of them. A lot of it is still that same fear as before. It's just different. I'm confident I can make money now, but I'm not confident I can inspire and lead people to not only make money for me, but make their lives better for them. That's what my transition to now, because I'm starting to hire people. I've got a, a few virtual assistants. I think I'm gonna hire a sub two student or an Astro student. I think she's both actually, um, to help me out on acquisition side. And we're starting to hire people and that gets to a different conversation of what's leadership and how do you lead effectively and how do you support other people in their journey as well. That I think is one of the biggest fears for me right now. And then I have a little bit also of fear of success, which is a weird one. I know a lot of people hear that and that's a weird one, but like in terms of the fear of how, what is going to happen once I am a millionaire, people are going to like me. Are they going to judge me? What are they going to think of me? And logically, I might know it's BS, but I still think it's there. I'm curious. Do you know what 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 fears do you think might be holding you back in your business right now? Um, I think it's going to be like fear of scaling. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Um, Was that similar to what I just said or in a different way? In um, a little bit of the same way. Okay. Yeah. You know, like being able to like really add value to those people. Just like really do it in a conscientious and not a haphazard way right in an intentional way where there's you know a process i'm delegating you know what you're doing right and i can set people up for success gotcha and um you know gotcha. i i have a fear that i'm gonna set people up for failure you right. know because they really depend on you when they're your employee uh when they're your teammate and um you know, it's, it's a fear, you know, it doesn't, it's something I'm working through and it's, uh, do you have any employees right now? Uh, not at this time. Okay. No, I have a lot of team members. Gotcha. And what's know, the difference? I think it starts there. Just, you know, other wholesalers and realtors. When you say team with. members, you mean people to JV with? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. People I collaborate with on a regular basis and, you know, they don't depend on me in exactly the same way an employee does, but you know, like, they need, they need, they need me. you to act, like perform in the transaction for sure. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And so, you know, I'm, I'm building up my confidence there. You know, I know what I'm doing. I really understand this well. I've mastered it and uh, I feel ready to start systematizing it and delegating it. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. And then what do you think? Do you think it's the same? I, I it's, I'm going to ask you first before I answer, but do you think it's the same thing where it's a faith thing to just get through that and like, just be like, look, it's just going to work out. It's going to, it might fail a bit, but we're just going to have faith that it's all going to work out in the end. Do you think it's the same? That's the same way to get through it. You know, there's a lot of ways to get through failure. Um, and you know, kind of have to go back to your like core values. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like for me, I use faith as a tool. There's other core values that I have, you know, one of them, you know, being community, you know, mm -hmm. lean on your community, right. Um, ask them questions, right. Like bring up your fears with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess another way that I think I'm going to be working through that fear is, uh, just getting through it. Like, um, just, just jumping in the ice bath, right. You know, it's, it's really cold. Yeah. It's, not fun. Right. Um, but you just got to like just put yourself out yeah. there and do it at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely get it. It's an interesting one. It's one I've been thinking about and why I started this podcast is like, because I have this sense that some people don't naturally do that, which mm -hmm. is hard. I think it's, I think it's easier for, I think, what do you, do you, have you read Rocket Fuel? 
Not yet. Okay. Do you know? Time. Do you know the difference between you probably? You, if you have, have you heard anything about the difference between a visionary and an integrator yet, or anything like that? A little bit, but go on. I'm just kind of curious. If, so I mean, okay, for anyone who hasn't read Rocket Fuel, it's um, visionaries are kind of the person. Who, the easiest way to explain is like Steve Jobs versus uh, Steve Wozniak. Like Steve Jobs is the guy who's selling it, kind of lead, creating the dream, creating the culture of what Apple is. And then there's the integrator who makes the vision happen, who, um, you know, creates the Mac, actually makes sure the processes are working together. Um, it's hard to recognize just off the cuff which one you are. Usually, I think, reading the book and kind of like identifying different attributes. I was going to ask you which one you think you are, but I wasn't sure if you read the book. Um, does, I'm just curious, do we either apply you think or probably both you're an engineer and usually engineers are integrators but i also see some visionary characteristics so i don't know i would definitely characterize myself as more of a visionary right. than an integrator but i'm kind of like stuck in an integrator role yeah um, that's what we all are when you're doing a one like one man show but i can do it right exactly i mean you have to do it in order to you have to do both somewhat mm -hmm. um cool yeah, no, I mean, I just like, I like starting, like at least some point getting into the mindset stuff for people, because I think that's really what makes or breaks somebody. Like if you had to give a percentage, how much do you think this business or business in general is mindset versus actual technical knowledge of what's going on around you? About 90% mental. Yeah, 90% mental guys. Like, honestly, like I think like people shrug it off things like daily affirmations, meditations, all of that type of stuff. But I think it can make the, or break you as an entrepreneur. Um, so I don't know. I just really like talking about it and trying to understand where people come from, how people deal with it, um, deal with fears in particular. Um, and I think we did a really good job with talking about faith in general. Cause, and I'm curious as this came up to me earlier because I know it's hard to articulate. You were saying it's hard to articulate, but define faith. Um, I think, you know, it's kind of better when it's something that is larger than you. Right. Um, if your faith, faith grounded in, um, you know, something that's going to look out for you, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, meditation and you know I, I don't i don't want to get too esoteric you know i want to keep the conversation grounded and um you know as far as like developing one's faith you know it's uh it's definitely you know you, you see different things that shouldn't happen like an, an a like an a causal connection mm -hmm. um you know where you know, you were, you meditated, you're putting in all this energy and then like this, like putting all this good energy out into the world. Um, you're where you're supposed to be. You're doing it right. And then you just get this like fat deal falls on your plate, right? you know? And, and it's like, did my meditation cause that to happen? Not necessarily, but was there a connection at all? Yeah, I think I think there was, you know. What changes your attitude, which changes how you act in that deal, which I think in a big way does cause it. But I know what you mean. It's not a direct causation. Exactly. Same way. Exactly. It's it's uh, you know, there's there's a relationship mm -hmm. there. It, it wasn't a. That's what's called an a causal connection. It's a non intuitive right. concept. It's like what, like, you know, like how 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 was that connected but not caused by it it's right like, well like exactly. my thoughts there's no like i can't measure how it it gets into quantum physics so, well, do you, you know, know a, do you know a, can you think of a specific example where that happened like like where you were like you were maybe in a starvation mindset and then you started doing something meditating whatever you somehow got out of that mindset and then something happened can you think of a specific example man yeah i think um you know just this year as a whole, mm -hmm. you know, being what it is, um, a $200,000 revenue year. Oh yeah. Um, 
very little overhead. Right. You know, I lost $10,000, you guys know, but you know. That was his entire overhead, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really cash thing business. Uh, and it was really important to step into uh, an abundance mindset um, to be able to achieve that. And I'm conscientious of how when I do occasionally slip into a scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. how the abundance, you know, the money, the opportunities, the the valve closes. Right. I'm like, what's going on? You know, why why is what? there not a lot of activity going on? It's like, well, check your vibe first. Yeah. Check it's so vibe. true. It's so true. What how what do you think is an effective way? Well, first off, can you think of a is it you just said the whole year. Okay. So do, what do you think was happening last year? Because you started last year i met you we were talking last year and i have a similar story by the way i like last year i had one deal that was ten thousand dollars um so like i was in a starvation mindset and that completely changed for for you what what do you think changed how do you how do you switch from survival mindset to a much more abundant mindset um you know i'm not there all the time obviously and it's certainly it's a, uh, it takes trust to lower your defenses. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of defense mechanisms, like, uh, especially within our ego that are there to protect us. Right. Uh, we develop from childhood and a really young age. And, um, you know, when you're in a defensive mindset, a lot of times you, you're not open to opportunity. Uh, you know, when you let me know about the astro flipping thing, you know, I was receptive and I was right. open. Uh, Instead of like, who the, who the heck is this guy? Yeah, I just, you know, I don't know this guy. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm in a bad day. Me. I'm just not enjoying life, whatever. You wouldn't have even noticed. Say. Yeah. And um, you can kind of, you can navigate, you know, this all wholesaling journey, uh, just kind of sizing people up. And right. just seeing the way they handle certain conditions. And if they're handling it in a very scarcity mindset sort of way, and you know, you don't judge people by one scenario, but right. over time, as you get to know them, uh, you're like, man, this guy just has this like really kind of, he's wigging out on these like little issues. And he has this like, you know, I give him a call, I ask if he has any deals, and he goes, ha ha, laughs in my face. And is like, there's no inventory. It doesn't appreciate that I put in the energy to give them a call. Also, their mindset is already like, there. he didn't say, I don't have anything right now. He said, there is no inventory. That's a very definitive statement of there is nothing out there. I will not find anything out there. You will not find anything out there. And I'm stating that and putting that out to the universe. I can already tell that guy's in a scarcity, scarcity mindset. Um, I will, even if I don't have anything in inventory, I'm always going to say, I don't have anything right now, but I'm going to get something soon. Don't worry. Right. Always. Yeah. And you know, if I'm you'd be shocked how much these time. little things matter, it is insane how much the difference between those two statements are going to change how much money is in your bank account. It's insane. It doesn't, it doesn't even make sense like scientifically, but like this is where that faith cut starts coming back about the statements you make reflect what the type of money you make. Wow. I'm going to coin that one. Wow, I'm, not, I'm, not <laughs> I'm going to have to like replay that recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quote. That We're going to cool. put that in <laughs> Dr. Seuss. What now, about uh, Tell me about your faith. Um, so what, you so my faith, I mean, I'm also not very religious in, in that sense. I like, it's not like I believe in the definitive personal God that a lot of people believe in, but I think he's kind of, I think it's just all a substitute for the same thing of how everyone is connected. Everything's connected. Like we literally life scientifically, we're all related. Did you guys know that your DNA is 50% same as a banana? I learned that recently, which is insane. Half of you is the same as a banana. Really? I'm just going to let that sink. <laughs> like actually though, in the sense of like, you're so connected to the universe that you don't even understand your atoms in your body are in, are made from star bursting, which is the same thing that created everything.
right? You are connected to the energy waves of everything. Cause, and I, and I go to like quantum physics and physics just because it's such a beautiful story of how we're all connected. We all have the same atoms from the same things. Um, and I just truly believe that one of the greatest things about being human that I think is different than any other being that we know of is that we're able to change the frequencies in a way that I don't think animals and objects can in the sense that we're able to change the frequencies to manifest whatever we want. Um, so to speak, you know, in within reason, there is you aren't going to grow wings. The world. There are, there is privilege that exists. You're not you going to start growing wings and fly out yeah. the door. Like, you know, it's not like, yeah, it's obviously within reason, but in the sense of you, in the sense of what you say is what's going to happen. Like if like it's, it's obviously within reason that you can't choose something that's against the laws of the universe, like growing wings, that's not going to happen. But if it's something that's possible for one human, it's possible for you. I honestly believe that in my opinion. And a lot of it is, has to do with an understanding that we don't understand everything. Right. You know, like a faith is like a lot of like, you know, scientifically our brains reduce the mm -hmm. world right there's a lot more going on than what we perceive right and also science doesn't 100 percent know everything yet so yeah. we don't know what will happen yeah you can't disprove a lot of things yeah uh, within this conversation point. right and you know when you get into you know where you know quantum physics meets psych psychology yeah meets you know the business you know? Yeah. One of the, the, I don't remember who told me this quote, but it was, it was somebody who was like a pretty extreme atheist, but even he said, this is that he said something on the lines of like, God doesn't exist, but he works in the sense that that faith works. The faith part works, whether there's actually a man in the sky or being in the sky doesn't really matter because the faith part works for achieving the goal of what you we're going for with that prayer or with that meditation or whatever you do. Um, it does completely change what actually physically happens in your life. Which Atheism is, is a faith. Or, yeah. It's a faith that there is no God. Right. Exactly. You still can't prove that there's not. Right. Um, but either way, the point being that it is an, I like this conversation a lot because I think faith is one of the only ways I know of how to get over fear when there's no actual evidence of it yet. It's got to, it, I feel like every first action has to start with that. Like if you're doing something for the first time, you kind of have to have faith that it's going to be okay in the end. And you don't really know until it happens, then you have the actual evidence. But until that point, the most you have is watching other people to know that it's going to be okay. And, um, and, uh, that faith. So yeah, baby steps, baby steps. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to overwhelm yourself hundred percent. So it's cool. I kind of lost track of where I was going with this. There was somewhere where I wanted to go with this, but basically, so we were talking about scarcity versus abundant mindset. And I'll talk about how it was for me real quick, just, so we can put it out there. Cause I, my story was last year and I feel like you're, you had a similar story last year. I only had one deal, only 10 K this year has also been amazing. And I feel like it has to do with just changing the statements I make, which is insane. I remember it's, it is weird how uh, this was an interesting, this is going to get real philosophical. Like, um, do you know who Jordan Peterson is? Have you ever heard yeah. of him? Yeah. Amazing psychologist. I don't want to get into the whole political thing with him, but he was talking about a very Christian idea of the spoken word about how it is very purposeful that when God, like in the first seven days, he spoke existence. And I think that is truly how things come into existence is either writing it down or speaking it. It can't just be in your head. And it's something that I've noticed and helped me tremendously in that even just, just saying this doesn't work always. I also want to say that, that like, it's not like 
if your grandma died, you're going to say you're happy and you're going to be happy. That's not going to happen. But the point is, is that um, if you're saying what you say on a day where it's a normal day, even if you wake up feeling, uh, feeling worse or not feeling good, you will start feeling good if you start doing a daily affirmation of something like, I am amazing. I am a conqueror. I am here to make money. Money comes to me abundantly and I receive that money. Doing things like that, are it's just insane how much that changes the whole landscape of, um, of just what you're able to achieve in general. Um, yeah, being in, uh, in flow, there's a term called synchronicity. Mm-hmm. It was coined by Carl Jung, if you've mm-hmm. heard of him. We're um, smart, FYI. <laughs> he has a good book. <laughs> and he talks a lot about, you know, these like a causal connections. It's pretty mind-blowing stuff. He's changed the world with his psychology work. But, mm-hmm. you know, he talks a lot about how, you know, to be uh, in sync with with the world, you know, it uh can really when you're when you're saying those words out loud when you change your thought processes what you're doing is you're harmonizing with the world around you Mm -hmm. um and there is a connection between everyone if you've ever been a trap in a traffic jam we're all connected we're all in our little cars um you just feel everyone slowly getting everyone is connected (laughs) there you know like the only reason the traffic jam exists is because we're all here we're all connected we're all in this yellow submarine the beatles had something to say about that right and so if we can like get into more harmony with the world around us these sort of miracles kind of appear to happen uh because you just changed your words but it was you know, the function is you are getting in sync with the world around you and you are in the right place at the right time. Right. So I'm going to switch it up a little bit because this, I don't know why, I just want to ask this question. Who are your heroes? Um, probably like Tim Ferriss, mm-hmm. um, uh, Jordan Harbinger. Who is that? I never heard of him. Oh, man, he's legit. Who um, is he? He Tim was... Fis- uh, oh, sorry, you keep going. Jordan Harbinger is a, um, he went to, he was like a stock trader. He was like a lawyer, some crazy guy from out of like Harvard. And then he like broke off because he's just like an amazing communicator. That's his Mm. skill. And um, now he has this podcast and he does his own things. Um, But like at the age of 16, he was recruited by the FBI uh, Mm. to like help catch child predators on the internet because he's like such a whiz. And like he, the reason why the FBI knew about him is because he accidentally committed like like wire fraud at the age of like 15 <laughs> yeah. and like ordered a bunch of pizzas to his school All right um and they're like yo like this was like really illegal who did this this is very sophisticated like this a 15 year old did that and then yeah, they got right. on his radar and anyway he's okay. just a, a really smart guy cool so any so tim ferris what was his name jordan jordan harbinger, harbinger. he has a podcast cool any others um you can say no that my wife oh cute (laughs) so what about what about these people make them your heroes what attributes of those two and your wife that really are make them men and women that you look up to probably like uh the impact that they've made um Mm. their ability to positively influence the world around them um they're there's not like a lot of scandal around them you know they're right. pretty transparent people um you know there are heroes out there that are just actually just not i don't really admire their character right very much but like, they're very influential people but mm-hmm. i don't really admire their how they treat others right um and so i really just uh and I don't know these guys personally, of course. but from what I've taken so far, you know, they've imparted a lot of wisdom and knowledge on, upon me. And I, I've, I aspire to be like them as uh, you know, an influencer myself and, and help the world around me. hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I like it. I, I thought of that question. I'm going to add it to every single one, just because I think the attributes you see in a hero 
are the attributes you naturally want for yourself or the ones that you like aspire to be whatever, whoever you choose as your heroes or hero. Um, like, it's funny. I have very two, for me, it's very two conflicting heroes. One's Muhammad Ali and one's Warren Buffett. And if you know both of them, there are parts of them that are completely contradicting. Muhammad Ali is probably one of the most arrogant braggarts to known to man. And then Warren Buffett's probably one of the most humble people ever. But I think I like Warren Buffett being a billionaire and still being one of the most humble people ever. And then Muhammad Ali, I like the fact that he said over and over again, I'm the greatest in the world. And that's why he was the greatest in the world. I think on it, that contributed it so much. He's a manifester in a way that I have not seen anybody else really be. Um, and also the fact he just didn't care about what anybody else thought and he stood up for what he believed in. So, yeah, I think those are two. I think those are all good heroes. I like Tim Ferriss too. He's a good guy. Um, if you were to go back to yourself when you just started wholesaling and just started real estate, what would you say? It's all going to be all right. <laughs> I like that one. It's all going to be all right. Yeah. <laughs> anything more than that or just say you're gonna you're gonna show up you're there it's gonna be all right and then out like you're and then you're looking at your your old yeah. self is looking at you just like yeah just have okay. faith in yourself you know you're i gonna, love it it's gonna work okay you know? for sure just i like going that. i love it yeah. that's good yeah because honestly i seriously have this belief that it's always that fear that's keeping people back and it's it's something for sure that we need i want that's why i'm starting this podcast is to talk about it try to go a little bit more to the darker side of what's keeping us back and what could be what we can do to keep it going. I've had, I've had Curtis was my first one and it was cool talking to him. And now hearing your opinion on it too, is pretty amazing. This guy brought a bunch of books. What's this book? Um, so this is another, I know we're kind of coming up on the hour here. Yeah. This is we're a book I really soon. wanted to recommend. It's called the biggest bluff. Nice. And um, I think, you know, we talked a lot about faith and, you know, it's important to, you know, stay grounded, you know, stay in reality. Um, this book is all about poker hmm. and, um, you know, you can sit down at a poker table and have all the faith in the world, but you'll lose a lot of money. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you're not right. going to play poker, you're going to lose your right. shirt and that's what's going to happen in this game. Right. Wholesaling, real estate investing, like right. if you don't know what you're doing, you can you can get in trouble right you know you do there is the part where you need to know the technical yeah. stuff too it's yeah a hundred percent you know that so totally makes sense the reason why i recommend this book and i wish you brought that out earlier now i have a ton of questions is because it's uh poker is the best analogy to real life decision making explain have you heard of game theory yes um game theory is how the Cold War was fought. The military didn't know what was going on in the Eastern Bloc, uh, in Russia, in the USSR. Uh, we had to think of, think about it and, and strategize. And um, so, game theory is a way. What was uh, is an important thing, obviously, and it, and it came from poker. Like right. the all of the uh, you can Wikipedia it and and all of the concepts from game theory were derived from poker. Um, there's something about the percentage of information that I have versus the, per, the information that we all know. Um, you know, that being, you know, how many cards are in the deck? I know exactly how many aces are there. Right. I know what cards are in my hand, but I don't know which cards are in your hand. Right. And um, there's something about the ratio you know, of that game of the known versus unknown information. That is an amazing metaphor, uh, analog to real world decision-making and strategy. Right. Um, and so this book is written by Maria Konnikova. Um, she is a behavioral psychologist. Uh, so uh, she went and learned from one of the best poker players in the world, how to play poker and became a pro. Um, and she didn't know how many cards were in a deck when she started. And the reason why Eric Seidel brought her on as a mentee is because he wanted to grow the game 
And she talks a lot about uh, decision making. And, um, you know, if you really want to improve your judgment and have really discerning judgment, that's a skill that can be developed. You know, that, you know, is a concept from mindset because, you you know. So I want to get into this conversation. Yeah. It's my podcast. I don't care. We'll go over a bit. Um do it. With the with the poker, because this is how I thought of poker, and I'm going to tie it back to what we've been talking about in the sense of I think one of the biggest things with poker is how you speak the words to get somebody else to think something else, which really is just energy transfer. In in my opinion, it's like I'm I'm, I'm trying to transfer into the other person what I want them to think about me right now or somebody else. That in and of itself is a way of manifesting what you want for the game. I think that's what bluffing is, right? I mean, I think that huge part is, it's not the same as mindset necessarily, but it's the same as what we were talking about with energy. And I think that's a huge portion of that game. There's the strategy of what's happening with them that you go off of, but then you also have to use your word, use your mannerisms in order to convince somebody else of what is true and what is not true. And honestly, in poker, the craziest thing is sometimes you, once somebody folds, um, you'll never you'll never get to see what the truth was. So in a weird way, like maybe I had, I don't know, a, a flush or something, but you convinced me so much that I'm just going to fold and then I'll never know whether you had a flush or not. But I, 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 I the truth is, Truth is, I have the better hand because you folded, whether that's true by the rules or not. And that's a lot of what we do as wholesalers. You know, it's a big poker game. It's right. decision making. It's sizing people up. Are they playing me? Are they not? Are they being truthful? Right. And, you know, as a wholesaler, we're the biggest bluffs around, man. <laughs> I, yes. I mean, we're... Not in a bad way. What do you think? What do you think? What do you mean by that? That we're the biggest bluffs? I... I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to close on the house. That's I'm going to wholesale it, but I'm going to let you know that I'm going to buy it. And I right. have the capacity to close. Legally, I have the capacity to close. Right. But in my mind, I know I'm going to wholesale this. Right. That's a bluff. Yeah, it is. It is a bluff in the sense that I get what you mean in the sense that like I have to tell the person that I'm going to buy this. What I say, because I... I like doing this more because some people have trouble with this about like what's the truth and what's not the truth. I don't want to get into this. Just I don't care if we're going over because I like I like this topic about what truth is because a lot of people view truth as being like, oh, you're being you're not you're not being honest there. Like you should just immediately tell the person that you're wholesaling it and explain to them exactly what that means. The issue with that is that by you being so inserting that into the conversation, you're actually hurting the other person mm -hmm. in a in a way because, because you're misrepresenting the value you can bring them. Because they all they don't understand the value that you're that you are going to bring them. Um, so because now that seller is going to have trouble finding a buyer for their property. It's going to be really difficult. And for that to happen, and you're you're doing a disservice by by immediately going into, hey, I'm not personally closing, but you know, I'm finding somebody. I kind of agree in the sense that, like, but then that person is gonna have trouble finding the buyer. They're not understanding your value, but you're gonna deliver your value. And you you are buying it, but you're not closing on it. Let's do a quick role play. You. You're the realtor. I'm the buyer. We're gonna do a sailor. realtor. Um, you know, ask okay. me. Ask me. You know, the good question. Are you gonna? Are you gonna wholesale? So are you gonna? So are you a wholesaler? Do you wholesale this? Are you gonna wholesale this? Uh, how much? Uh, how much money's in your bank account? How much money's in your in your pocket right now, Jonah? There's no money in my pocket. Uh, what you know? What what goes on in your house? What goes on in your bedroom? The any of my business? It's true. It's not any of my business. What, as long as the contract says it. What happens in my business, how I perform on the terms that I agree to. Do you to, actually say that? I never say that. Well, what do you actually say? Let's do what you actually say. You're doing that to make a point. I'm making a point. Yeah. The That's point not is, my attitude. Yeah. <laughs> I was already like, damn, I don't know how the agent would 
react to that necessarily. But I get your point in the sense that it doesn't matter because you legally have the right to do it in your yeah. contract. Because that's a, a, a manner. Wait, real quick, say your actual answer to that because I know okay. you get that. So are you going to wholesale this? Like what are, what are your intentions with this property? Well, at the end of the day, my intention is to fix and flip this. If it's not the best uh, fit for me, you know, I don't want to leave the seller high and dry. So, I mean, that's why I have an assignability clause in there because I do have a very extensive network that's kind of acquiring thousands of properties a year. So, you know, if I have the opportunity to not leave the seller high and dry, I'm going to, I'm going to do that because right. I'm looking out for them. hundred percent. Okay. Great answer. I love it. So hundred percent agree with that, that, um, in the end, because this is what happens, because this is also where your your attitude, at least for me, where you're getting into the part where it's none of their business, I think is when you're performing all of your tasks and they're getting mad about it for some reason. That's where I think it is really where it gets into, in my opinion, is like when you're like, you have EMD in, but they don't like that you assigned it because meh, 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 meh. It that's how I view it. It comes down to integrity. Right. Doing what you say. Right. And if you sign up for terms of a contract, that's the end all be all is the contract. Right. And as long as you're performing on the terms of that contract and you're not defaulting, you're no liar. Yeah. You can say whatever you want. I I'm have gonna, this inspection period. I'm, I'm a unicorn, you know? That's why I never, <laughs> that's why it? I never, even if, if my sole intention is wholesale property, even if I know it's a good deal, this is my personal philosophy. I don't know how you feel about this. I will never, I will never lock up a property and not put an inspection period on it unless to unless I'm either know I'm going to buy it myself or B, um, I'm 100% willing to lose my emd right there like i would i would need to lose my emd for my own sake if i don't put any inspection period on it whatsoever i don't know how you feel about that but to me that's because if i if i don't if i'm not putting in emd and i'm saying i'm 100 percent gonna buy this in the contract that's to me where it feels more like a lie i don't know how you feel about that but that's how i've started doing it not that I haven't done that before, by the way, because sometimes I have, because I have done it and then I made 13 K or something like that. But I'm curious, what do you think of that? Um, I think that we don't owe anyone anything. No one, no, I don't owe anyone anything and no one owes me anything. Right. So if I don't want to buy a house, unless I signed up for specific performance on the contract, right. you know what that means? No. Specific performance? No, I don't know what that means. It means that if I don't close on this, I, I it's not that I lose my EMD. If I signed a contract for $200,000 on specific performance, you can sue me for $200,000 right. if I default on that contract because I committed to buying that. Right. And that's a different subject altogether. And so if someone's going to come at you like you need to close on something or some crazy woogie boogie thing is going to happen, they're just bullying you because right. you don't owe it to anyone to do anything. Right. You owe it to yourself to have high integrity and perform on the terms that you agreed to. Right. Yeah. And that's all that matters. So, okay, I'm going to start shutting it down. What, how can, how can the people reach you? What do you want to plug? What do you what do you want people to know? What do you not want them to know? Uh, Last chance. What happens in your bedroom? <laughs> my my wife is my business partner. There you go. Uh, so just I, just meetings. That's all that happens, guys. We just do just business meetings. meetings. Uh, so what? Anyway, so what do you want to plug? How can people reach you? Sarodevelopments.com uh, is a website. Check it out. I'm on Let's LinkedIn. See if I can put Facebook, this in the chats. Instagram. Sit. Hold Sit. on. What Let's what do you, what do you want me to put in there? Sarah. Um, developments.com um that's my website um you can can they reach you in that yeah it has my phone number on there okay. um you so can, that's gonna have everything on there guys yeah. um anything else anything else you want to say uh crush it out there don't be afraid let's go episode two wrapped up Thank guys you, i'll Thank see you, so you. <laughs> i'll see you guys 5 p.m 
in a week. I'll announce who the guest is. See you guys there. Bye.